thank you everyone for coming to this session. And thank you, Sri Khant, Sivateja, and Jiaming for your excellent talks. I have learned a lot from your talks. I believe so have most of people in this room. Okay. I'm Hong Yichian. I'm currently a fourth year PhD at Columbia Business School. Today I'm excited to talk about the frame control framework Yash and I recently developed. We gave it a cool name called mirror back pressure. This mirror comes from the mirror descent in optimization literature. So we believe it's a very powerful framework and it helps us understand how to solve the payoff maximization problem in constraint queuing networks. So throughout this talk, I'll use right hailing as a concrete example to help you understand what, how this uh, framework works. So one of the motivation example is the control of a right hailing platform. So I believe all of you have experience with right hailing platforms. It has uh, many control levers at disposal. For example, by adjusting the price of different rights, the platform can regulate supply and demand and maximize various objectives. Another control lever you might not be that familiar with is the entry control. So for the ride sharing platforms where they cannot do dynamic pricing as freely as they wish, which is the case for DD in China and Ola in India, entry control becomes very important, which is the ability to reject an incoming demand. Why can't we just serve all the demand? Because suppose all the customers are going from location one to two, but very few are coming back. If you accept all the demand, the cars are gonna pile up at location two unless you do some empty car routing stuff. Other control levers include assignment control, also called dispatch control and matching control. So Yash, I, and Sid Banerjee, we had an earlier work on this. By assignment control, we mean when the demand enters the system, the platform can dispatch from one of the neighboring locations. And he gets to decide from where to dispatch. Other controls including repositioning of empty cards as well. So if you look at this control problem from a high level, the key challenge is the tension between the payoff effect and queuing effect of each decision. By making a decision, you change the rate of sending cards from location one to two, and that also gives you a revenue, a utility, or other forms of payoff. And the platform's objective is to maximize the payoff. Implicitly, this requires the system to keep the, the stochastic network stable. So I'll put a quote around stable because I'm being hand-waving now, what I mean by stability. So the platform has to be aware of the congestion in the system. There are many other systems with the same flavor of trade-off between payoff and queuing effect, including script systems and bike sharing. If I have time, I'll briefly talk about these examples by the end of the talk. So here's a preview of today's talk. I'm going to introduce an online control framework, which we call mirror back pressure, for payoff maximization in constraint queuing networks. And we'll use the entry control of right hailing as a pedagogical example to demonstrate the idea. So in the full paper, we also have results for joint entry dispatch control and joint pricing dispatch control. Here are the key takeaways of this talk. First of all, we want to advocate for considering state-dependent control in this type of platforms. By state-dependent, we mean we need to be aware of the current distribution of cars in the system when making a decision. If you look at the right hailing literature, there are many state-independent policies, which is very simple. You estimate all the demand arrival rates, you solve a linear program or a convex optimization problem, and you operate the system by randomizing your solution. So the issue with this type of control is that it doesn't change when the system state changes. And it requires a very accurate estimate of the demand arrival rates. It's not robust with regard to model misspecification. But if you consider state-dependent policies, actually it can give you parameter-free policy. You don't need to know the demand arrival rates. It has good theoretical guarantee for transient performance and steady state performance, and it performs really well in the simulation which I'll show you later. The second message is to consider a state-dependent policy, back pressure is actually a very proper framework. So now you might have already have an idea of what 
back pressure does. So back pressure is greedy, but in a very smart way. It's aware of the congestion. So it considers the payoff effect and queuing effect simultaneously. A vanilla version of max weight uh, back pressure will use queue lengths as congestion cost. It's probably near optimal in many settings. And however, in the model we are considering and in many systems, a vanilla version of back pressure suffers from a so-called underflow problem. I'll go to the details later. And we identify this problem as the incompatibility of gradient descent with regard to the state space geometry. We fix it by using the idea from mirror descent and using the transformation of queue lengths instead of queue lengths as a congestion cost. For example, you can use the logarithm of queue lengths and that solves the problem. That is all of our key contribution. Okay. So our work contributes to the vast literature on max weight and back pressure by dealing with the underflow problem. In addition, it contributes to the application area, including write hailing, script system, bike sharing. And on a conceptual level, this type of system is also related to the online stochastic bipartite matching, process of flexibility, and network revenue management problem. Okay, now let's go to the model dynamics. Okay. So we model the city as a number of physical locations, marked by one, two, and three here. And there are a fixed number of cars circulating in the system. The cars don't enter or exit the system, so it's a closed queuing network. We consider a slotted time model. At each time slot, a random number of customers arrives. The customer's type is specified by his origin and destination, J and K. Okay. So the number of customers traveling from J and K is a random number, capital VJK, with mean little vjk. The entry decision is very simple. So there are capital VJK arrivals. How many of these customers am I going to serve in this period? If you don't serve them, they'll abandon and leave the system. And when you make an entry decision, it has two effects. Let's look at the graph on the, on the right. There's a guy who wants to go from one to three. If I decide to serve him, then a car will leave location one and relocate to location three. Also, for each type JK customer I serve, I get a payoff WJK. And the platform's objective is to maximize the total expected payoff over a finite time horizon. Okay. And in this model, we assume the relocation of cars happen in one period. But in real world systems, the cars may take many periods to go to the destination, right? However, in this talk, we focus on the key challenge of maximizing payoff while keeping the geographical flow balance constraints. So these constraints are there with or without the delays. Also, in the simulation part, we will add the service delay and show that simple alteration of our policy works pretty well. Okay. Any question regarding the model? Okay, now let's see what back pressure does in this setting. So the idea of back pressure, as I mentioned, is congesture aware greedy. It wants to maximize the payoff and reduce the congestion in the system. The congestion is indicated by the queue lengths. This is actually a two-line policy in this setting. Suppose at time slot t, let qt be the queue lengths at each location. For type jk demand, I compute this quantity, which is the payoff I'm gonna collect from serving this demand and the reduction of congestion in the system. So conceptually, the system manager will penalize herself when putting cars in the longer queue, and she will reward herself for drawing cars from the longer queue. So if the payoff outweighs the increase of congestion cost, then this customer is worth serving. I'm going to serve all the type JK customers in this period. Otherwise, if the increase of congestion cost overwhelms the payoff you are gonna collect, 
then you're gonna drop, drop all the type JK demand in this period. It is very simple. Yeah, question? No, this is the vanilla version of back pressure that are normalized Q length. That the current Q length, yeah. This Q length is divided by the total number of cars in the system. Yeah, so here demand is the customers, and the jobs circulating in the system are the cars. It's a network of cars. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, and as a result, the car will relocate from J to K. So the cars they don't move unless they are dispatched. Right. So if you are gonna serve a type JK customer, you'll you'll make a decision if you accept that demand, the car will relocate from J to K. Right? Because the customer type is JK. Yeah, only if there's a car available, right? And as you'll soon see, the problem comes when there are no car available at a dispatch location. Okay. So in our model, if there's uh, no car available, he will abandon. Yeah. Right. Any question? Yeah. Cars. Uh, the queue of cars, so the customers, they don't wait. Right? At each period, if they are not getting matched, they leave the system. Yeah. So essentially, you don't want the cars to pile up at certain parts of the city, because that will have a bad impact on the circulation of cars in the system. No, cars don't enter or leave the system. Yeah, initially you have K cars and it's a closed K network. Just keep being K cars. Okay. Yeah. So actually, this simple idea of back pressure almost works. Actually, the title of this slide should be Why Back Pressure Almost Works. Okay, so in this system, no matter what policy you are using, in the steady state, your performance is upper bounded by the solution of this very simple linear program. Let ZJK be the steady state rate of accepting customers going from J to K. Then the objective here is the payoff they're gonna collect in the steady state. And your ZJKs must satisfy the flow balance constraint, which means the rate at which cars entering lo location should equal to the rate at which they exit a location. This must be true in the steady state, right? And also, you can admit as much as BJK number of customers. Right? So this gives you a steady state upper bound. As you have probably seen from Shrikant's talk, the idea of back pressure comes from considering the dual of the optimization problem. So what back pressure does in this setting is very interesting. The normalized Q lengths, they function as the Lagrange multipliers of the flow balance constraints. Which means if you keep operating the system according to the vanilla back pressure, the normalized Q lengths are executing a dual stochastic gradient descent on the dual function of this problem. And here is what the dual function looks like. The Ys are the dual variables. If you use vanilla max weight, then your Q lengths function as the Ys. If your Q lengths can converge to the optimal dual variable, which I denote by Q, Y star, then your policy is symptotically optimal. Okay. If that's the case, then back pressure works. 
because you are using the right Lagrange like, multiplier, using the right shadow price. However, there are issues with vanilla version of back pressure. Let's look at this illustration. So Y star is the unconstrained dual optimum. The dual problem is unconstrained, right? However, your Q length, the state space of your Q length is constrained. We recall there's a fixed number of cars in the system. After normalized, the state space is a probability simplex, right? So if your Y star lies outside of the probability simplex, then your Q length is never gonna converge to the optimal dual variable. And your policy is not gonna be symptotically optimal. And there's another more serious issue, which we call the underflow problem. It looks like the following. So on the left hand side are the dual variables, the state space of dual variables. The current iteration is the blue Y. You're trying to take a gradient step from the blue Y, which is feasible in the unconstrained problem. But because of the state space constraint of Q lengths, which is the Q lengths cannot be negative, you cannot move your Q lengths along that direction, the gradient direction. As a result, you cannot fulfill the gradient step and your Lyapunov drift argument doesn't work. So people call this the underflow problem. And there are many examples where no dual variables lies in the probability simplex. No optimal dual variables. Each zjk is bounded by between zero and phi jk. So this is are just the rates, right? And just the rates, not the, the queues. Yeah, in the simulation, I'll come to an example where the relocation of car takes non-trivial amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. So the flow balance constraint is, is true. It's a closed network. Any other question? Okay, so here are the two issues with vanilla ver version of back pressure. So when does this underflow problem happen? It doesn't always happen. Because you are using the Q length of cards as the new variable. If you do that, then the, um, this will not work. Yeah. So are you asserting that y star lies in the simplex, or are you saying that it doesn't lie at all? If it doesn't lie, there's a problem. Even if it lies in the simplex, there's also a problem. If it doesn't lie, then it's problem one. Your killings cannot converge to y star. Even if it lies in the probability simplex, because of the behavior of killings when some cures are empty, you also, there's a possibility you cannot approach Y star, your Q length. Okay, so this is not a constraint for the, prob the, the underlying problem. This is a constraint coming from the fact that we are using Q lengths as the dual variables. Right. Yeah, artifact, yeah. Yeah.
So this underflow problem doesn't always happen. It happens for multi-hop networks, okay? And it happens for the case where payoff maximization is the objective. So for a single hop network, actually this doesn't happen because the dynamic of queue lanes under a back pressure policy is a projected gradient descent. So it has a good property on the boundary of the state space. But for a multi-hop system, that's not the case. Because if the upstream queue is empty, it cannot dispatch, you will also starve the downstream queue. Actually, this problem has been considered in the literature, and there are many workarounds. But unfortunately, they don't work in our setting. The first uh, workaround is putting conditions on network. So in this paper by Dai and Lin, they consider the class of problems where there's no underflow problem, okay? Which means there always exists a gradient direction where the dispatch queues are not empty. So by definition, in their model, there's no underflow problem. But this rules out many interesting cases, including the model we are considering. Also, there's a virtual queue approach, which means when you try to dispatch from the location that doesn't have a car, you create a virtual car and send it to the destination. Right? This will fulfill a gradient step. However, because this is a closed network we are considering, these virtual cars never leave the system. Right? So the analysis for the virtual queue also doesn't work in our setting. So if you are curious about the virtual queue approach, typically when you send virtual packets, you can get a hand on the virtual system. But you get an indirect analysis of the physical system. They also always they usually use some positive recurrence argument to bound the performance of virtual system and queuing system. But in our case, it doesn't work. Also, people has also proposed perturbed max weight. The idea is also very simple. Instead of using the queue lengths as dual variables, they use the queue lengths plus some constant as a dual variable. If the constant is chosen properly, the underflow problem doesn't exist. However, if you want to choose the right constant, you need to have an idea, or have the knowledge of the optimal dual variables. But the main benefit of back pressure is you don't need to have any knowledge of the system parameter, right? So the research question is, is there a systematic way to address the underflow problem while retaining the advantages of back pressure, which doesn't require any knowledge of the system parameter? Actually, the perturbed max weight is trying to use the Q lengths plus a constant as a dual variable mm -hmm. to push like the optimal Q lengths into the interior of the state space. So it's not a projected gradient descent. It's yeah. And, and we cannot do projected gradient descent for a multi-hop system. Let's just consider a very simple example. Right? There are two locations. The current Q lengths is zero and five, okay? Now suppose I want to dispatch a car from location one. The queue lengths now be become minus one and six. When you project it back to the positive orthant, it becomes zero, six. So there's another car appearing at destination location. Yeah, a similar thing will happen. You have to create a virtual car to fulfill the gradient argument for a multi-hop network. Then there are also, at the destination, the number of cars will increase by a little bit, by a fractional number, if you do the projection, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, the example I, I talked about is the, I'm, when you project, it's not, a, so you cannot design a policy such that it executes the projected gradient descent for a multi-hop case. It just, they are different. 
the dynamics of the dual variables under a projected gradient descent and the dynamics of your queuing system, they are, they are different for a multi-hop system. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we take a closer look at the underflow problem. So what's the issue with underflow problem? Why does it, why is that, um, where does it come from? As we have shown, the vanilla version of back pressure, it executes a sub, sub gradient descent on the dual problem, right? And the sub gradient descent is the right thing to do if you are solving an unconstrained problem. Like when the state space is the whole Euclidean space. But in queuing systems, the state space of queue lengths, which you use as dual variables, it's typically not the whole Euclidean space, right? For open queuing network, the state space of queue lengths is a non-negative organ. For closed networks, the state space is the probability simplex. And you can have even more complex state spaces. For example, like at each location, the buffer size is finite, which is the case for a bike sharing system. Then your state space is something like an intersection of a box and the probability simplex. And you can see these underflow problems, they happen on the boundary of state space. So the issue boils down to the state space constraint, which is the, the problem geometry. The vanilla version of back pressure is not respecting the problem geometry. And here is a one slide tutorial of mirror descent, okay? This mirror descent idea was proposed in the 80s by Nemirovskin and Yudin. It's actually a non-Euclidean version of gradient descent. It's a family of policies with one degree of freedom, which is your choice of the right notion of distance, a distance generating function f. You choose the function depends on the problem geometry. Let's look at the illustration below, right? You want to solve an unconstrained dual problem on the left, where y star is the optimal dual variable and y is the current iteration of the current value of dual variable. This red dotted arrow is the gradient direction you want to go, right? But you don't update the dual variable directly along that direction. You first map the dual variable to the state space of Q. The distance generating function will also determine a mapping between the original space and the queuing space. In our example, actually the mapping is uh, why is the log of Q, right? And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the, this Euclidean space and the space of Q length. You take the gradient step from Q, you get a new iterate of Q, and then you map it back to the space of dual variable. Because this algorithm maps back and forth between the space of dual variables and the state space of Q length, it's called a mirror descent. That's where the name comes from, originally. And in our setting, to make the policy work, we use this mapping determined by the distance generating function f, the mapping of q as the Lagrange multiplier. Okay. If you choose this distance generating function as a quadratic function, then this mapping is an identity map and you recover the vanilla back pressure but if you choose other more interesting distance general functions that fit the geometry of the state space of Qs, you get a, a mirror back pressure policy. A good thing about the mirror back pressure is that it has an established convergence theory. If you're using vanilla version of back pressure, the right Lyapunov function to use is a quadratic function. It's a L2 distance to the optimal dual variable. But if you are using a, a mirror back pressure, the right Lyapunov function is Bregman divergence determined by this distance generating function. And I want to make a comment that actually it's not obvious to develop a policy that executes mirror descent. So to develop, develop this policy, I actually I have to massage the mirror descent a little bit such that it becomes a queuing policy. And also, in order to make the convergence argument work, there's a novel drift argument when Q goes to near the boundary of state space. Okay. 
So this slide is a high level introduction of mirror descent. Now let's come back to our concrete model. Like in our example, the state space of Q lanes is a probability simplex. So a natural notion of distance is KL divergence, right? Let's just plug in KL divergence as the distance generating function. Then it gives us the following policy, which is simply use the log of normalized Q lanes as the congestion cost. Again, the system manager will compare the payoff coming from the dispatch, which is WJK, and compare it with the change of congestion cost, which is the difference of log Q lanes. If the payoff outweighs the introduction of congestion cost, then I'm gonna serve all the demands of type JK. Otherwise, I'll drop the, all the demands of type JK in this period. So this is a very simple policy. And we can prove a non-trivial performance bound. Okay? So the optimality gap of this mirror back pressure policy is K over T plus one over K. K is the number of cars in the system and T is the finite time horizon. So this optimality gap is for the per stage payoff. As you can see, this is a transient bound. As T goes to infinity, this gives you a steady state bound of one over K. And this idea can easily extend to a more complicated case where we'll do the joint entry dispatch control and joint pricing dispatch control. You still just formulate the primal problem and make sure the queue executes the mirror descent on the deal of that problem. So for the joint pricing dispatch control, which we are not going to details here, the optimality gap is similar. It's the square root of k over t plus one over k. And now I want to show you some simulation results in a realistic environment. Let's consider Manhattan partitioned into 30 locations. Okay? And to make the simulation realistic, we are gonna add service times, which means the cars will take number of minutes to go from one location to the other. The service times are taken from Google Maps, and we use the trip duration as the payoff. Actually, we experimented with many choice of payoff, randomly generated payoff, and our policy performs well for all of them. So it's not sensitive to your choice of the form of payoff. And because in the system where the traveling of a car takes time, the service time is gonna impact the system by impacting the availability of cars, right? And this can be captured by Lito's law. Let's say it takes DJK amount of time for a car to go from J to K. Then in the steady state, here's the number of cars in transit. And this number should not exceed the total number of cars in the system. We just add this constraint in the network flow problem we formulated before and do the mirror descent on the dual. This actually shows this mirror descent framework is quite flexible. The policy now takes the following form. It computes this quantity which takes into account the payoff, WJK, the reduction of congestion cost, the difference, which is the difference of log Q lengths, and a penalization for longer trips, right? And, and when you do the mirror descent, the lambda T will keep adjusting over time without, without the need to know the system parameter. And here is the performance of different policies. The x-axis is the time of the day from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. The y-axis is the performance normalized by the steady state benchmark, okay? So this red line is the performance of vanilla back pressure, which is over 90%. The green line is, oh, sorry, the red line is mirror back pressure, which is over 90% of the steady state benchmark. The green line is the vanilla version of back pressure, which obtains approximately 80% of the benchmark. And this purple line is a static policy, which requires the exact information of the demand, all the demand arrival rates. Even though it has all this accurate information, it still can only achieve slightly more than 70% of the, of the benchmark. So this shows you the benefit coming from considering a state dependent policy.
yeah, we use the constant uh, travel time. It doesn't change uh, as time goes by, but I believe like this result is robust to that consideration as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I only take into account the number of free cars at this at the locations. Actually, this policy doesn't even take into account the number of cars in the pipeline. And the blue line is the greedy policy, which is serving all the demands as long as you have a car. So this policy performs poorly because it ignores the flow balance constraint. Right? And the system gets messed up, cars pile up at certain parts of the location. So in the first simulation, we consider a setting where there are enough number of cars in the system such that the little slot constraint is not binding. Now let's consider a case a simulate the environment where there are not that many cars, and the little slot constraint is binding, and we get a similar result. So mirror back pressure is 90%, vanilla back pressure 80%, they both outperform the static policy, and greedy policy performs poorly. So now I'll briefly talk about other application. In the last two slides, I talk about the other applications of the model we are considering. First example is the city bike system in Manhattan. So in this system, there are fixed number of bikes circulating in the system. It's very similar to the ride-sharing model. However, there's one difference, which is the number of docks at each location is fixed. So basically, the state space, as I mentioned, is the intersection of probability simplex and the box constraint. And the city bikes are currently using a bike angels program, which incentivizes trips going from particular origins to particular destinations. By using the mirror back pressure policy, we can design such an, an bike angel program, and it takes into account the log of number of bikes at each system, at each location, and the log of number of empty docks at each location. Okay. That's the right thing to do. Also, there's a very interesting example I read from this paper by Johnson Simkila Sun, which is the analysis of script system. So script is a coupon. In this system, it's a non-monetary economy where you trade coupons for services. So actually, in DC, there are these uh, 150 families which has babies to babysit. And they are tired of spending all this money on hiring babysitters, so they decided to help out each other. So initially, they each get a number of coupons. Once they help out the neighbor, the neighbor will give them a, a script or a coupon. And the platform can decide when to decline a trade. Okay? And the policy, again, is very simple. When you have a very small number of coupons, the, pod, the platform will suggest you not to, not to spend them. Because once you use up the coupon, then you will be no longer able to request services and you impact the circulation of coupons in the system. Right. So this is exactly the same as the right hailing example I mentioned. Okay. Okay, to sum up, in this talk we propose an online control framework for payoff maximization in constrained QA networks. It has many applications, ride hailing, script system, and bike sharing. And there are many interesting future directions that we can consider. First of all is the introduction of travel time. If the packet, if a car takes a non-trivial amount of time to go to the destination, how do we modify the policy to get a non-trivial performance bound? Right? And also, one benefit of using back pressure is that it doesn't need the knowledge of demand arrival rates. So when the demand arrival rate is time varying, we should be able to get some performance bound if they are varying slow enough. Another interesting direction is the centered version of mirror back pressure policy. Actually, we've been discussing this policy with people from ride sharing. They say, okay, your policy is really cool. It's robust with regard to the demand arrival rates. But we have all these reinforcement learning teams. They have a reasonably good estimate of the marginal value of having another card 
at a certain location and certain time of the day. How do I incorporate that information into our decision? Actually, it's very simple. Instead of using the payoff WJKs, you use WJK plus the difference of the estimated dual variables. And you can get a better performance bound that gets smaller once your estimation gets better. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. I think, I think it can, it's a very powerful framework. It can have many other applications. So it tackles this trade-off between the payoff maximization and the constraint queuing space. Any policy, any problem of that flavor can be tackled with the mirror back pressure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming.